Good afternoon. Uh, I don't have anything at the top. I see Matt's not here. Who wants to do the honors? Go ahead. All right, thanks. Uh, China's foreign ministry said that Hamas and Fatah agreed to end their divisions and form an interim national unity government during negotiations in China that ended today. What's your take on this agreement? Uh, so we have not yet reviewed the text of the so-called Beijing Declaration. Of course, the, uh, we will do that. Um, but as we have made clear for months, uh, uh, Hamas is a terrorist organization, something that we obviously made clear before October 7th. But um, when it comes to, to governance of Gaza at the end of the conflict, there can't be a role for a terrorist organization. Hamas has long been a terrorist organization. They have the blood of innocent civilians, both Israeli and Palestinian, on their hands. Um, and so when you look at the post-conflict governance of Gaza, uh, we do see, as we, we've made clear, we want to see the Palestinian Authority uh, governing a unified Gaza and the West Bank, but no, um, we do not support a role for Hamas. Uh, Blinken is, that is set to speak with Wang Yi in Laos. Will he raise this, and what's your evaluation of China's role in these talks? Is it helpful in trying to reach a ceasefire deal? Um, so I don't have any, any, as I said, I don't want to get pass judgment on this declaration that came out today beyond what I just said because we haven't reviewed the full text. I want to be us to be able to look at it um, and, and, and give a more thoughtful response, which, of course, we will do. But when it comes to China's role, I think, as you know, the Secretary has talked to Wang Yi a number of times about playing a constructive role in Middle East diplomacy uh, since the outbreak of the conflict. He called Wang Yi from Saudi Arabia on our very first trip to the Middle East just a week after October 7th, and he's uh, spoke to him on the phone a number of times and spoke to him when we've had the occasion to travel to China and when Wang Yi's had the occasion to travel here. And what we have generally encouraged China to do is to use their influence uh, with countries in the region, especially countries with whom they have a relationship with where we don't, to discourage any escalation in the conflict. So, for example, Iran, which has support, uh, continues to finance and support proxies that have launched uh, attacks on Israel, or in the case of the Houthis, have launched attacks on commercial shipping. We have used China to uh, use its influence to try to bring those attacks to an end, and we'll continue to do that. And then uh, Israel's foreign minister said that instead of rejecting terrorism, Abbas embraces murderers and rapists of Hamas. Are you concerned that this could complicate reaching a ceasefire deal, this response from Israel? We don't, be, uh, we don't think that anything related to this declaration should any, in any way have an impact on the ongoing discussions to reach a ceasefire. As you've heard us say, we um, think it's uh, an agreement is in sight. We think it's achievable. Doesn't mean we'll get there, but we have made progress in the talks. And no, I don't think either this announcement or the reaction to it should should play a role in making the the making a conclusion of those talks more difficult. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Just on uh, with that, just that. Uh, so you're saying that you know it doesn't matter whether Hamas uh, actually has a unity government with the with this, let's say Fatah and the other groups and so on. And basically uh, announced that they adhere to the principles uh, enunciated by this group, by the PLO, and so on. So they have no role to play so, whatsoever. So, Saeed, they have not announced that they accept the principles of the PLO. That is an important uh, point that you make. Hamas has not renounced terrorism. It has, not, it has not renounced the use of violence to achieve its political aims. It has not renounced the destruction of the state of Israel, something the PLO has done. Um, it remains a terrorist organization. It remains committed to killing civilians. It remains committed to bringing about the destruction of the state of Israel. So no, we do not see an organization that uh, uh, believes in those tactics and believes in carrying out terrorism as a suitable organization to govern the Palestinian people. Okay, so uh, in fact, in their you know, statements and so on, and their discussions and their interviews, and we have seen their spokesmen engage on you know, Arab satellite TV uh, all the time, and they actually say that they uh, they will go along with the, you know, the principles of the PLO. They accept the two-state solution. They accept whatever agreement that uh, can come about. They are focused on the ceasefire, you know, and achieving a ceasefire. Uh, you don't think there is anything positive in these gestures? They, the fact that they most recently spoke about uh, a two-state solution as. You know, as as they, a solution to the have, conflict, they have not in any way committed to a two-state okay. solution. And I, I, I should just make clear, they could have in the context of this declaration today, signed on to the principles of the PLO, and they did not. 
So right. maybe a spokesman makes statements from time to time, but Hamas as an organization has not renounced its support for violence, its support for terrorism, or its commitment to the destruction of the state of Israel. And that's an important point. So, you know, just, I don't want to belabor the issue, but, you know, looking at how uh, much influence uh, Hamas has had in Gaza over the past, you know, for a very, very long time, 17, 18 years and so on. And do you see, do you see a situation where they actually can be, you know, completely taken out or you know, can be uh, decapitated as the Israelis, uh, just to use the Israeli term and so on, from the political scene. I mean, they have, yeah. so, they are embedded so, in the society yeah. itself. So a few things about that. Um, as you've heard us say before, we, of course, believe that Israel can achieve military aims when it comes to the defeat of Hamas. But that is different, as you make clear in your question, to political aims. And we think that ultimately the best way to ensure that Hamas does not regain strength and reassert its position inside God Gaza is to offer a different political path forward for the Palestinian people. And that's what we uh, are committed to doing. That's what we have been trying to work on with all of our partners in the region. But I do think that there's another point that deserves to be made here, Saeed, which is um, the Palestinian people in Gaza ought to have a say in this as well. They ought to have the, the foremost say in choosing who their leaders are. And I obviously can't speak for the Palestinian people, but if you look at the death and destruction that Hamas's decision to launch the attacks of October 7th has brought on Gaza, um, they have, there's no one that has brought more pain and suffering to the people in Gaza than Hamas through their decisions first to launch the attacks of October 7th and then their ongoing decision, which continues today, to hide among civilian communities and use hu uh, civilians as human shields. So um, uh, that's a, ultimately something that the Palestinian people have to speak to and speak to through their representatives. But I will say on behalf of the United States, we do not see it uh, in any way as acceptable for a terrorist organization to play a role in governance because you would see what you have always seen from Hamas, which is attacks on civilians, terrorism, and a further continuation of the conflict that has plagued the people of Israel and Palestinians for decades. Well, you know, I agree 100% with you that, you know, the, the, the final say ought to be for the Palestinian people and nobody else. I agree with you with that. Uh, let me ask you about, you know, prospects for the, the ceasefire. Uh, are, you, uh, are you inclined to believe that the Israeli Prime Minister may surprise everybody and announce that uh, he agrees to the term of the ceasefire? What is your reading of what's going on? Because, you know, I mean, uh, we are probably at the point where Every little detail has been discussed. Every iota or every I has been dotted and every T is crossed and so on. Yeah. So I don't know what the prime minister will say either in his speech to, con his con to yeah. Congress or in any of his other public remarks. I'll leave that to him. But the discussions continue, and there are a number of issues at play that we're still working to reach conclusion on that we have not yet reached conclusion. Yeah. My final question is on, uh, you know, there was a report that uh, Israel bombed the 10th of journalists. I wonder if you know about the, this report, and uh, of course, you know, there's been something like 160 Palestinian journalists that have been killed thus far. Uh, why is there no outrage uh, on the fate of journalists in Gaza? So I, I think there's a great deal of outrage about the deaths of journalists. You have heard us speak to this, not just me, but the Secretary has uh, spoken to this a number of times and made clear the importance we place on the work that journalists do in conflict zones around the world, and of course, especially in Gaza, where we, in many cases, the world only knows about what's happening inside Gaza because journalists who risk their lives, put their lives on the line to bring us the news are there every day reporting it. And so we mourn the death of any journalist just as we mourn the death of any uh, civilian. And it is why, again, we are working so hard to try to reach a ceasefire. It's why the president has put his own political muscle behind this. It's why the secretary has worked on it. It's why others in the administration have worked on it, because we believe ultimately the only way to stop the suffering of, of civilians, all civilians in Gaza, journalists, others who, uh, uh, other aid workers, um, others who do important work, as well as just people trying to go about their lives. The only way to alleviate that suffering in the daily death toll is to reach a ceasefire. Thank you.
Yeah. Thank you. Um, Republicans are criticizing Vice President Harris for not attending or not planning to attend Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech to a joint meeting of Congress tomorrow. She'll be campaigning in the Midwest, but Republicans say she's boycotting the speech. Um, of course, there's also no public meeting right now between Secretary Blinken and Netanyahu. Can you say if this is a boycott or if there are any concerns on behalf of the administration about the optics of meeting with Netanyahu publicly? So Republicans are going to say what Republicans are going to say. Uh, I don't have to. I don't spend much time worrying about that. Um, nor do I spend much time worried about optics or worried about substance and reality. And the reality is, the vice president has, office has made clear that she had a pre-scheduled trip before the prime minister announced this date, uh, which is a date he decided in consultation with Congress, not with the administration. So she had pre-announced uh, travel. And I would just ask, what is more important, being there for a speech or meeting with the prime minister and talking about how we can work together to address our concerns? I would posit that a meeting is more important. Have Israeli officials reached out with any concerns? This is the first time this has happened, the vice president not attending a speech before a joint meeting of Congress in over three decades, I believe. Not that I'm aware of. Just to follow up, Monshan, would yeah. there be any uh, meetings with other uh, uh, you know, members of the delegation that will come with Netanyahu? I don't know who is accompanying him, but I don't, let's say at the State Department. I don't have anything to, to announce, but typically when you have a head of state or head of government meeting to the United States, there are always meetings that happen on the sidelines of that visit, um, uh, and I would expect that to be the case here. Thank you, Matt. Switching to the topic, can you give us a sense of where things stand in terms of implementation of the Repo Act uh, after yesterday's presidential memorandum, which passes some of the authorities to the Secretary of State? And the yeah, we are working hard on it uh, here at the uh, State Department. There are other agencies, the Treasury Department, uh, who, are, who have pieces that they have to implement as well. Um, I don't have details to announce today, but we're working very hard to um, execute the details as delegate and execute, execute the responsibilities delegated to us by the President. Give it a timetable. Like, no. You know, like no. Sure, no. No. As quickly as, 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 as quickly as, po as quickly as possible. There's important work we have to do, and we want to get that work done as quickly as possible. We want to get it right and be thorough. Um, Japan uh, decided to pass uh, three three billion from proceeds uh, from frozen Russian assets. Do you support that decision? Uh, uh, of course we do. Um, moving to uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian Foreign Minister is in Beijing today. Do you hold any hope uh, in terms of any behavior change when it comes to China's? Uh, you know, supporting Russia in Ukraine. So I'm not going to make any uh, assessments about what might happen or try to gauge expectations of what might happen. But I do think it's important that China hear directly from Ukraine about the toll that Ukraine has suffered through Russia's war of aggression, which we know China is doing a great deal to fuel through their support for reconstituting Russia's defense industrial base. Um, we have always made clear that it is important that every country in the world recognize that in this conflict there's an aggressor and there's a victim. And we shouldn't uh, treat the two parties as if they bear equal responsibility or as if that this is some war that just magically popped out from nowhere without one side being responsible. And that it, when it comes to looking at how this war can end, it's important to remember those core principles. And so. We have made that clear when we have engaged with China on the topic of the war in Ukraine. Uh, I know that uh, other members uh, of NATO and, uh, and European countries have also made that clear to Russia, and we think it's important uh, any time that any country, and of course, of course that uh, uh, in includes China, um, uh, hear directly from Ukraine. Do you expect any engagement between the Secretary and, and Mr. Kuleba ahead of the Secretary's own meeting with Chinese foreign minister? Uh, well, I do not believe that Ukraine is coming to ASEAN. They're not a member of ASEAN, <laughs> so he does. He, so I mean, I, I don't, I don't quite understand the question. He does speak with Foreign Minister Kaleba all the time, and of course that will continue. Any, any call? In, uh, I, I don't have any calls to announce. Today, Alex. Fi final topic: Russian forces conducting, uh, you know, second nuclear uh, missile launcher drills in less than two months. What, what do you think they are doing there, and, and what is your reaction? I, I don't have any assessment for that from here. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Thank you. I have two questions. One on Sudan. You just released a statement uh, on the talks that will be held in Switzerland next month. Uh, why did uh, the U.S. move uh, the talks from uh, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia to Switzerland? And what do you expect from uh, from these talks? So first of all, I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, frame it as the United States. These are talks uh, that we hope will take place that will be co-hosted by the United States, the government of Switzerland, and Saudi Arabia, and. 
the I, the goal of these talks is to build on the work that has already taken place in Jeddah and to try to move them to the next uh, phase. We continue to believe there is no military solution to the conflict in Sudan, uh, and we believe that convening these national ceasefire to talks and making clear that they are backed by key international stakeholders is the only way to pro to end the conflict in Sudan, to prevent the famine that exists there now from spreading, and to create space to restore the civilian political process. So we hope that the SAF and RSF will accept this invitation that we've extended to them. And uh, as I said, it is not just from us, it's from the government of Switzerland, the government of Saudi Arabia. And I would note that uh, these talks, should they go forward, will be joined by observers from the African Union, Egypt, the United Arab Emirates, and the United Nations. Did you receive any response from uh, the Sudanese The parties? invitation just went today, so we have not yet, but we're certainly hopeful that they will accept. Um, we think it's important that they use this opportunity to negotiate a ceasefire, to stop this hor horrific conflict and help ensure humanitarian access gets, it, gets to the Sudanese people who need it. Uh, and on Iran, the Iranian president has uh, said today that Iran stands ready for all negotiations on nuclear program. Uh, what's your reaction? Um, so we have long made clear that we support diplomacy. We see that as the chief route to um, uh, uh, dealing with uh, Iran's nuclear program. But we're a long way from that right now, especially when you see the steps that Iran has taken to flagrantly uh, flout the requirements of the IAEA. And so we would hope that as a first step, Iran would come back in compliance with the demands of the IEA that they have been, uh, as I said, flouting uh, here today. Does it mean oh, yeah, sorry, that, that you're not ready for talks with the new president? Uh, so, so let me back up and say, I, while we certainly saw the comments from the, the new president, I do think it is important to remember that ultimately these decisions are decisions that are made by the supreme leader, and we have not made any assessment that Iran is yet uh, changing its overall strategic approach to these issues. And finally, on, the, on this, that means you're waiting to hear from the uh, from Khamenei, not from the president. Uh, I don't have anything to add beyond what I just said on that. So. Thanks. Uh, sorry, just to follow up on Sudan. The Jeddah talks have been unsuccessful so far. What makes you think that this format will be more successful in reaching a deal? So we, the, the way to answer that is, I can't give you any assessment on the likelihood of a deal, um, but we just want to get the parties back to the table. Um, and what we determined is that bringing the parties, the three host nations, and the observers together is the best shot that we have right now at getting a nationwide cessation of violence and getting a, uh, a ceasefire that would allow humanitarian actors to surge humanitarian assistance in and get back to this place where we can um, find a mechanism to restore the democratic transition that Sudan was on. And so we are looking, you know, we, we, this is the, the, the secretary spoke to this on Friday. Sudan right now, unfortunately, doesn't get all the attention it should from, I believe, uh, the world. It certainly gets attention from us here. We know it gets attention from others in the region and others in the international community. Um, but there is a horrific human tragedy taking place there right now. Uh, these two parties that continue to uh, fight each other and put civilians at risk and bring civilians uh, not just through direct harm, but harm through the humanitarian crisis that has been created. So. We're looking for anything we can do to get these talks restarted and try to get a ceasefire. And so um, if, uh, uh, if we can bring the, the weight of the United States to bear and our partner nations, Switzerland and Saudi Arabia, can do so as well, we think it's important to do that. Um, aside from the location, obviously, are there any changes to the format being made that you hope will help move this forward? I don't want to talk about the the details of the uh, of details of how the talks would proceed. I think it's something that we ought to hold um, uh, and discuss with our partners before making those public. But ultimately, these are decisions that SAF and the RSF have to make. They're the parties to the fight. They're the parties that are putting their own countrymen in such grave danger and costing the lives of so many of their uh, innocent countrymen. And so we're going to do all we can to get these talks restarted with our partners, and we'll hope that the SAF and the RSF will come to the table um, for talks. You know, they've committed to, um, to make various steps 
uh, in the past and have blown through them time and time again. And so we're hopeful that this would be an opportunity to finally get our way to a ceasefire. Yeah. Matt, thanks. Um, Donald Trump's confirmed that Netanyahu is going to go to Mar-a-Lago um, tomorrow. Uh, do you have any concerns that this meeting is happening ahead of his Congress address and also meeting with, with the president? Um, and I have one more after that. Uh, I don't. Look, obviously, we have one president at, at a time, uh, and I think it's always important that everyone remember that. But at the same time, uh, it's fairly common that uh, heads of state and heads of government in foreign countries meet with political parties while they're here in, in the United States and meet with nominees for president while they're here in the United States. And we do the same thing. Um, the secretary has met with opposition leaders and opposition candidates a number of times in his visits around the world. So um, that in itself is a fairly routine event. And, um, both, both, both on behalf of other countries and, and on behalf of the United States. And one, just going back to the region, uh, there's a report about this. It's described as a secret meeting with the UAE um, about the Gaza Day After plan. And the report, the reporting is that State Department Counselor Tom Sullivan attended. Can you confirm whether that meeting took place? And if yes, uh, whether you can give us any more information about it. So that did meeting did uh, take place. Tom Sullivan was uh, in the UAE at the end of last week to uh, advance our plans around a ceasefire and advance our plans uh, around the day after. But um, as often happens, I know people will portray these meetings as secret, but oftentimes uh, these meetings involve pretty delicate, sensitive discussions and sensitive negotiations. And there's a reason we don't make the the topics of those discussions public, and I think I will decline to do so here. Just one more, because there's uh, an op-ed coming from um, from the Emiratis as well. Their special envoy wrote about this. Um, she said that the plan involves deploying um, a temp you know, temporary international mission to Gaza. Uh, can you comment at all on whether that's accurate or? No, I, I have not read the op-ed that you're referring to. Obviously, we have been in discussions with our partners about what security inside Gaza would look like, uh, both during a ceasefire and uh, at the end of the conflict. But I don't want to comment on the particulars of those discussions from here. Just to follow that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, on, the, on the day after plans, um, can you give us an understanding as to how far along those plans actually are? Um, if you guys have agreements in terms of the countries that would partake in this international force um, to stabilize Gaza. You're stipulating, I, I, you're stipulating something as fact that I have not said as, as fact from here, but go ahead. Okay, well, um, <laughs> if you would like to, you know, describe it in your own words, have at it. But just our... Are these agreements still in the works? Are they almost done? Um, are they ready to roll out, you know, day two after a ceasefire? Just give us an understanding of where that stands. So the pl it, it really does vary when you look at uh, each a at different aspects of what's required for uh, Gaza. Um, we have had a number of discussions, including fairly advanced discussions with countries in the region uh, about security situation, how to address the security situation, and ensure security in Gaza. And the same is true for governance. And there are proposals that we have put forward to our Arab partners. Um, there are proposals that they have put forward to us, and we have been working through various differences. And it's, it's, it, it, and when I say it's not, it's not the case that every country in the region is signed up to the same plan either, right? People have different views about what the best way would be to accomplish this, and people have different political imperatives that they need to be responsive to. So we are working through that. Um, uh, it has been a high priority. Barbara Leaf was in the region last week meeting with foreign ministers and other leaders. As I said, as, as I noted, Tom Sullivan was there on Friday. Secretary has had a number of phone calls over the past couple, a couple of weeks to talk about these plans. And I don't want to put a, a timetable on them other than to say it is critical that the mo work move forward, and that's what we are uh, uh, working to do. Okay, and then just one question on um, the previous question she had about Trump meeting with Prime Minister um, Benjamin Netanyahu on Thursday. Um, are, are you guys concerned at all about the former president trying to influence the Prime Minister at a moment when there are these uh, tense, high-stake negotiations to come to a ceasefire and hostage agreement? Uh, I don't know what the former president will do, just as I don't know what any uh, uh, 
private citizen will do in a meeting with the prime minister or other officials with the government of Israel or any government. I would just say, speaking generally, that we would hope every American would... But there's certain things well, he's allowed to do and not allowed to yeah, do. Yeah, sure. But I'm just saying, I'll just say we would hope that every American would find it in the interests of the United States to work towards a ceasefire, um, to work to get a ceasefire over the line, to work to get the American hostages home. Remember, there's still Americans who are held hostage, not just Israeli citizens, but Amer uh, Americans as well. And so we believe it's in the interest of everyone in the United States to try and reach a ceasefire that gets our hostages home as well as uh, ends the suffering of Palestinians. And, of course, that includes Palestinian Americans who are in Gaza uh, and helps us build better, broader security and stability for the region. And can I just ask one clarifying question on that? Um, the Hatch Act prevents citizens who um, don't have authority from the United States um, from directly or indirectly um, having correspondence with foreign governments to try and influence the measures or the conduct of those the foreign Logan governments. Act. Is that the Hatch Act or the Logan I mean, sorry, it's the Logan, Logan Act. Act. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm I'm my old DOJ Act. hat on here. Yes. I still remember. I Thank remember you. little bits and pieces of it crawling how, around back here somewhere. How would you guys know if the Logan Act um, was violated here, given you're not going to have any U.S. official in these meetings? Um, maybe you have a plan for getting a readout. Can you just explain to us um, how you know? In I, I think like when this? it comes to any question about enforcement of U.S. law, um, I would defer entirely to the Justice Department. I don't think it's in, appropriate for me to comment in any way. Okay. Yeah, I'll come to you next, but go ahead, Saeed. Yeah, very quickly. I mean, you know, we have witnessed before, and I'm old enough to remember the Reagan campaign, and they actually did influence uh, the hostage negotiations and so on, and they delayed it. I mean, you know, there are examples in history where actually this happens, where, you know, certain contenders do not believe that we have one president at, at a time. Uh, I think it's a situation that is probably, you know, kind of critical and for you guys to deal with. Look, I'm this not case. going to speak to a meeting between the former president and the prime minister, but as I said, we would hope that no American citizen of any party would do anything to jeopardize the work to bring home American hostages who have now been held in captivity for over nine months. Go ahead. Thank you. On the topic of, of presidents, with President Biden being done in six months, uh, does the administration, thereby extension, the State Department, Antony Blinken, are they at risk of losing any leverage of ending the war in Gaza or in freeing the hostages? Uh, so the president uh, is the president and brings in his conversations the full weight and authority and credibility and influence of the United States. And that has not changed, and that is not going to change as long as he's president. And the same goes for the Secretary of State. And so when we have conversations with foreign governments, we always make clear our position and the things that we are willing to do to stand by our position, and that will be the case. If I may, if you'll indulge me, please, on Nicaragua. I know it's fully totally separate, but can I? Yeah. Or, OK, thank you. Religious freedom in Nicaragua, a couple questions. Uh, you, sir, you're, I'm sh sure you're familiar with it, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Uh, they say religious freedom conditions in Nicaragua are getting worse, deteriorating. In fact, you, sir, is holding a virtual hearing tomorrow to discuss the situation in Nicaragua, religious freedom. First question, will the State Department be in attendance at that virtual meeting? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I'm happy to check and get, and get back to you. Two, uh, U.S. Uh, you, sir, said recently, quote, Nicaragua's government continues to repress the Catholic Church for its human rights advocacy by arbitrarily arresting, imprisoning, and exiling clergy and lay people and shuttering and seizing the property of Catholic charitable and educational organizations. In fact, just recently, Ortega shut down Radio Maria Nicaragua. That all said, what more can the U.S. do right now, this moment, to help those in Nicaragua being persecuted for their faith. So you have seen us on a number of occasions speak out about the persecution of religious figures uh, in Nicaragua, Nicaragua and call for the release of religious figures, and we will continue to do that. Have you seen it? Is Ortega listening? Uh, I, I will, will say that it's not just something that we speak out on, but that we work with our partners in the region to accomplish. Uh, it is a high priority for us, the, the exercise of freedom of religion, both in Nicaragua and all around the world. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Uh, today, Secretary Blinken met with the Yazidi society leaders here at the State Department. And the Yazidi communities, since 10, 10 years ago when they faced the genocide, they are 
they never been so vulnerable as they are now. Unable to go back to their homes and also they are living in a dire situation in IDB camps in the coastal region. The so-called Chingal Agreement has not and no longer been implemented. What's the U.S. firm position on the Yazidi situation in the region and also the Shingad Agreement? Do you still have the faith in that agreement? So we do believe that the Sinjar Agreement was an important start for supporting those targeted in the uh, 2014 genocide committed by ISIS. But as you note, the agreement has not yet been fully implemented, which must be done in partnership with local communities, including the Yazidis. We continue to encourage the government of Iraq and the Kurdistan regional government to implement the tenets of the Sinjar agreement, including security, governance, and reconstruction in Sinjar. The upcoming 10th anniversary of the ISIS genocide represents an important uh, moment to demonstrate meaningful progress, and that's what the Secretary discussed uh, with those with whom we met today. And I think you know that the Shingal is a disputed area between two governments, Erbil and Baghdad, and there are several militia groups have control over the area. And this has political infighting has prevented the reconstruction of the city. So what what the role what 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 roles the U.S. can play in bringing the situation to an end and also give a relief to the Yazidi communities? So for pr protection for vulnerable ethnic and religious communities in Iraq has always been a priority for the State Department. Uh, since 2018, the United States has provided over $500 million in assistance to religious and ethnic minority communities that were targeted for genocide. Uh, we provide a significant amount of U.S. humanitarian assistance on the basis of need, regardless of ethnic or religious affiliation, in addition. And we continue to advocate for the security of Sinjar to be in the hands of federal police and Iraqi security forces, including the local police force established under the Sinjar Agreement. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu is here, and there's a big protest uh, planned for tomorrow outside the Capitol Hill. At the same time... Outside which building? Hill. The State Department? Yeah. yeah. Hill, not the State Department. Oh, the Hill. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Hill. Yeah. At the same time, uh, there are large groups expected in favor of uh, Netanyahu also. The local media reports that there is a possibility of clash and disturbance on the streets of D.C. tomorrow. What are your thoughts on that? What is your message to the protesters coming here from different states? So, look, we, uh, as you hear us say, uh, when we talk about protests around the world, and typically we from the State Department don't talk about domestic matters. There are other uh, agencies inside the U.S. government that do so. But, of course, we think all protests should be held peacefully. We support the right of Americans to protest. It's one of the things uh, that makes uh, America great and, and strengthens our democracy. And so it's people speaking their minds uh, either to the United States government, to, to United States government officials or to foreign government officials or, or who are in town. We support people's right to do that. But of course, those protests uh, in any event should remain peaceful. The Pakistani government was reporting millions of Afghan refugees uh, uh, but on the intervention of UN and United States, uh, Pakistani government extended their stay for one more year. What are your thoughts on this decision, and what is your what is your comment on the situation of Afghan refugees in Pakistan? Let me uh, take that that back and get you an answer. So one last question. Yeah. I may. Uh, so Pakistani on the directions of Pakistani government, the police raided the offices of a political party and arrested the spokesperson. Uh, they are also trying to ban this political party. You spoke about it uh, last week, but. What is your reaction on the raids on the offices of the political party and arrest of their spokesperson? So we have seen the reports of the arrests of PTI leaders. Uh, we are always concerned when we see arrests of opposition leaders. I'm always personally concerned when I see the arrest of a spokesperson. Um, we support the peaceful upholding of constitutional and democratic principles, including the rule of law, equal justice under the law, and respect for human rights, like freedom of expression and freedom of peaceful assembly. And we urge that these principles be respected in accordance with Pakistan's constitution and laws. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mitt. Thank you, everyone. And good afternoon. It's an everyone who are sitting here. My name is Niru Nira. I'm from Bangladesh, and I'm proud Bangladeshi American uh, living in this country last 24 years. I live in New York. I come here to talk. One thing, the running president in my country, what he is doing, the way we speak every time, thousands of students are killing, and especially women students, they got raped, killed under that uh, Prime Minister we call illegal, which is true, he is illegal, unelected Prime Minister Hasina Sheikh, what he is doing in my country right now. It's my concern. I know that concern of USA, 
and always we believe is super power and I live in, in this country and uh, my what I say what I can help from you for my country Bangladesh I only see my country Bangladesh life and everything is smooth thank you so we continue to closely follow developments in Bangladesh and call for calm and de-escalation and as I said yesterday we condemn any acts of violence whether they be acts of violence committed against peaceful protesters or they be acts of violence committed by people who are protesting the actions of the government we support peaceful assembly we support peaceful protests um, uh, but in all cases they ought to be carried out peacefully and the government should refrain from acts of violence against peaceful protesters um, but I would say that when it comes to Bangladesh, we also remain deeply concerned by reports of ongoing telecommunications disruptions across the country, which limit the ability of people in Bangladesh, including American citizens there, to access critical information. Um, That's something we have spoken out against in other countries, and we speak out against it when it comes to Bangladesh as well, and we'll continue to make those concerns known. Uh, follow up on Bangladesh. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, I informed you that there's a thousands of people are getting killed under the direction of Hasina Sheikh, the illegal prime minister of Bangladesh. Last night I learned uh, the tank and vehicle uh, with the logo of United Nations are being used. Uh, uh, and they're firing from those UN carrying uh, logo vehicle and killing innocent students. Also, there's a helicopter on the sky. They're also killing innocent civilians. It's like country is going into a civil war, number one. And number two, some public figure uh, name Nurul Haq, the president of Gono Dikar Parishad, and there is another leader, uh, Tarek Rahman, then another leader, Junaid Saki, then another leader, Abu Adnan Toha. Everyone is getting kidnapped by the government forces, and they're taking advantage because there is no internet, there is no telephone communication, and Prime Minister is sitting down at Gono Bhavan and directing police, army, um, RAB, and other uh, law enforcement agencies just keep killing because the world is, cannot watch what is going on. I know Europe satellite and American satellite cannot take the picture because there is no internet. And uh, I have third question if you allow me. Uh, America is the proponent of democracy and institutes of democracy in all over the world. We respect that. But under the direction of General Asif Monir of Pakistan and the Chief Justice of Poise Isa, they are destroying every single democratic institution in Pakistan. There is no reflection of the people's choice in Pakistan. Do you think America, other than showing concern and expect something, do you think that country is on the right direction? I, so I think that the, what we as the United States have always done, I should, and I should say what we have always done when we are at our best, is to speak out for democratic values around the world and make sure that, or, and make clear that countries are strongest when they uphold democratic values, countries anywhere in the world, and that's what we're going to continue to do. That's our greatest strength, and it's what we'll, con uh, what we'll continue to guide our approach. Do you, do, you think, do you think Hasina Sheikh and the authorities in Pakistan, they are listening what American and European governments are asking them to do? So we will continue to make uh, um, our priorities clear. We will continue to make our values clear. Does every country in the United States or in the world do exactly what the United States or any country in Europe or any other country around the world thinks they ought to do or thinks they have, how they ought to handle the uh, every situation? Of course not. Sovereign countries make their own decisions. They always have. They always will. Um, what we can do is impress upon countries what we believe are the right, right way to approach questions of fundamental freedom, questions of democratic values, questions of human rights, um, and bring all the influence we can to bear to urge them along that path. And that's what we'll continue to do. Would you like to make a comment that they're using United Nations logo on a Humvees and tank, and they're firing from that uh, vehicle uh, into the civilian, and uh, thousands of people are getting killed. Why so, they're using United so, Nations logo? So I'm not aware of that specific report. You should take, uh, address that to the United Nations, I would think. But I would say, as, as I have uh, made clear, we condemn any violence against peaceful protests. Um, peace, uh, protesters should be allowed to carry out their fundamental freedom of, of expression, their fundamental freedom of speech. And at the same time, we urge that all protests be peaceful. Thank you. Yeah.
Thank you, Matthew. On a different topic, how would you describe Secretary Blinken's relationship with Vice President Harris? Uh, he has an extremely close uh, working relationship uh, with the Vice President. He's actually known her for more than 10 years, worked with her before. Uh, she became Vice President before he came, became Secretary of State. Um, he spoke to some of this this morning uh, when he talked about how he's seen her uh, inside the Oval Office, inside the Situation Room uh, and overseas, asking tough questions about difficult issues and really getting to the heart of some of the difficult foreign policy choices that we face, um, and that he has been impressed by her um, both command of various foreign policy issues, but uh, just as importantly, her insights into getting at what really can be the nub of an issue and, and uh, trying to determine how we as a nation can move forward in a way that serves the American people. And would he be interested in continuing to serve under a potential Harris administration? You know, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. There's an election that's going to take place. I'm not going to comment on the election. I think we should take things one day at a time. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I don't claim to be an expert on this, but there's a British musician called Charlie who has described Kamala Harris as brat. Um, <laughs> she did give an interview to the BBC saying, uh, explaining what that term means. She said, he feels like, uh, talking about Kamala here, uh, feels like herself, but maybe also has a breakdown, but kind of like parties through it, is very honest, very blunt, a little bit volatile, like does dumb things, but it's brat, you're brat, that's brat. Just wondered if you had any comment on that as the possible future president. Whether my that my comment is I think, uh, I think I am officially aged out of participating in this conversation, and uh, I'm trying to think of anything I could say that wouldn't make me look worse for having say, saying it and, and coming up with nothing. So I think some things are better left to a younger generation to comment on, and I'm certainly not that. Thank you, Thank you so very much. Uh, I'm not sure if someone already asked about this, but it's about the U.S. troops withdrawal from the Iraq, as number of media reports suggest that Iraqi officials, Iraqi government, they want complete withdrawal of U.S. forces. And we have seen months before U.S. hosted top Iraqi officials regarding this. So the question is, with this intense and panic situation in the Middle East, U.S. is ready to do for uh, this, and there is specific quantity, specific numbers. U.S. have to keep your uh, with this withdrawal process. So I would refer you to the Department of Defense to comment on that in detail. But as we have said before, we are committed to the Higher Military Commission, uh, which is a process that is taking place in Baghdad to determine how and when the coalition's military mission will transition. We've spoken this to before to this before, and nothing has changed. Secondly, the Pakistani um, recent uh, military spokesperson highlighted three things. I asked before, and my senior colleague, Mr. Afridi, asked many times, that is regarding the uh, digital terrorism that Pakistani military spokesperson is mentioning again and again, and that is that is all about the all those vocals who are supporting Imran Khan and its part in narrative and all that. Secondly, he highlighted the number of operations Pakistani military is doing per day in 24 hours. That is between hundreds, 60 to 80 operations he mentioned. Uh, so there are two questions. So I already asked before that the firewall Pakistani government introduced to curtail media freedom, social media freedom. And secondly, the Pakistani officials, the security officials, they are again hinting more U.S. military assistance or something like that. So you have anything? anything so with that? respect to the, the first question, uh, as I've spoken to with respect to other countries, um, we support uh, media freedom in Pakistan, just as we support it around the world. And with the second, I don't have any announcements to make today. With that, I think we'll wrap for today. Thanks, everyone.